the fear of the upper room. We know the feeling of hard days and long nights. We know the grief of the tomb and the particular ache of saying goodbye. We know the pain of Good Friday, and we know the darkness before the dawn, and still. And, and still. still. And still. And still. And still. We believe. We believe that again and again, the sun will rise. Again and again, God will draw near. Again and again, the tomb will be empty. Again and again, we will march toward justice. Again and again, God will lead the church. Again and again, love will win. Again and again. And again and again. We will be loved. The journey will not be perfect. We will need to rise before dawn. We will need angels along the way. But again and again, the sun will rise. We, we believe. believe. Good day. On behalf of Heritage Presbyterian Church, I'm Reverend Michelle Hendricks, and welcome to worship this Easter morning. As we rejoice in the resurrection of our risen Lord, will celebrate the Sacrament of Communion. I invite you to take a moment now to gather the elements if you'd like to participate. With great joy and thanksgiving, let us be gathered to worship. On this blessed Easter morning, let us join together in our gathering words. This day is like every other day. Alarm clocks beeped, covers were removed, Coffee was brewed, and weary bodies came to life. And yet, this day is like no other day. For the sun rose, and we knew it was a miracle. The tomb was empty, and they knew it was love. So again and again, we say the longest night is over. Death has lost its sting. Jesus is among us. Alleluia, amen. Again and again and again. Alleluia, amen. <laughs>
had we been there that first Easter morning, it is likely that many of us would have been with the disciples, hiding out in fear, locked behind doors, alone with our thoughts in the upper room. I wish I could say that I would have gone with the women, that I would have been brave and determined. I wish I could say that I would have held onto my faith, but the truth is, we'll never know. What, what I do know is that Jesus came back for all of us, not the few who had maintained faith or the few who stayed with him until the end. He, he came, came back, back for, for the, the broken, broken and the fear, for the cowardly and the, and the greedy, greedy, for, for the, the women in the garden, garden for the for disciples, disciples hiding in the upper room. He came back for those who betrayed him and those who worshiped him. He came back for you and for me. So, so join me in the prayer of confession, knowing that no matter where we are on the spectrum of faith, Jesus lived, loved, and returned for us. Let us, Let us pray. pray. Beloved community, before God and before one another, our family, we confess. We have seen the sun rise and withheld our praise. We have seen our neighbors suffer and we withheld our aid. We have seen love extended and chosen to walk away. We have seen divisions deepen and manage to remain unfazed. God's love is like the sun. No matter how lost we are in the night, day after day, the light will find us. We are held in God's warmth. We are forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Alleluia. Amen. Hear now these words of life. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. The Lord's steadfast love endures forever. Let all God's people say, God's steadfast love endures forever. The Lord is our strength and our might. God has become our salvation. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Alleluia and Amen. of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Please take a moment to greet one another with the peace of Christ in person via text or email. Please join us in the prayer for illumination. God of the garden and God of the empty tomb, there are a million ways that you speak to us. You speak to us in rituals, both formal and organic, in drops of water on foreheads, in vows set at the altar, through pieces of bread dipped in ordinary wine, and through shared candlelight on Christmas Eve. You speak to us in nature. Your artistry shows up in starry nights, in the smell of pine, in rushing water, and in most every sunrise. You speak to us through our relationships, the comfort of a loved one, the laughter of our friends, the security of those who support us and cheer us on. You speak to us in so many ways, and we are grateful for them all. However, today, we just need one. That would be enough. So lean down and breathe life into these sacred texts. We are craving to hear your word like never before. We are craving to understand, to see ourselves in the story. 
We are craving proximity to you. There are a million ways that you speak to us. Today, we need just one. With hearts full of gratitude, we pray. Amen. Let us join the women at the tomb. A reading from the Gospels. Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they could go and anoint Jesus' dead body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they came to the tomb. They were saying to each other, who's going to roll the stone away from the entrance for us? When they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, and it was a very large stone. Going into the tomb, they saw a young man in a white robe seated on the right side, and they were startled. But he said to them, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He isn't here. Look, here's the place where they laid him. Go tell his disciples, especially Peter, that he is going ahead of you into Galilee. You will see him there, just as he told you. Overcome with terror and dread, they fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Easter morning has finally arrived. Christ has risen and we celebrate with alleluias. As we come to this part of the service, you might have been wondering which gospel account we'd hear. Each of us probably has our favorites. In Matthew, there's an earthquake, an angel, and Jesus appearing to the women as they excitedly go to tell the men what's happened. In Luke, there's not one, but two angels. And when they speak, the women remember everything that Jesus told them. And they go and tell the eleven everything. Peter runs to the tomb, finding it empty with only a linen cloth inside. John tells us of Mary Magdalene. She goes to the tomb and finds it empty. And she tells Peter and John, who foot race to the tomb to see if it's true. They see the linen cloth, one believed, the other doesn't understand, and they both leave Mary just standing there by herself. But then John sees Luke's two angels and raises him a resurrected Jesus, though Mary thinks he's a gardener until he says her name. Mark tells us of a very large stone a young man in a white robe, and the women fleeing in silence and dread. We have four different accounts of that first Easter morning. But don't worry, there's no need to be concerned about the differences in each gospel. There will be at least four different accounts of this worship service. Some will focus on who's involved, the liturgy, the sermon, or the music. With four different gospel accounts, we can choose the one we like best. It's sort of like choose your own Easter adventure story. This year, the lectionary has given us Mark's version. And we might be a little disappointed because it's not very exciting. But maybe we can make it a little more adventurous. After watching Joseph of Arimathea take Jesus' body from the cross and put it into a rock-carved tomb, the women went home for the Sabbath. Once the Sabbath is over, the women gather spices so they can anoint Jesus' dead body. And we can picture them making this walk in darkness, most likely in silence, as they each continue to process their grief. Finally, someone thinks about the very large stone sealing Jesus' tomb and they begin discussing who they're going to find and move it. What should they do? Do you go back home and, and find some men who can roll that stone away? Do you continue to the tomb and hope for the best? The women continue their journey. 
As the sun rises and they near the tomb, they receive their first revelation of the day. The very large stone has been moved. And I don't know what I'd think about this. Our initial reaction might be relief that the problem's been solved. But what new problems might it bring? I mean, is there someone else here? Are they friend or enemy? Do we even have the right tomb? And we've reached another decision point. Do you sit down and watch to see what happens? Do you return home and, and find some men who can figure this out and maybe Peter will bring his sword? Do you go into the tomb and do what you intended to do? With more than just a little bit of courage, the women go right into the tomb where a young man tells them they're in the right place. This is indeed Jesus of Nazareth's tomb, the one they saw crucified. Of course, they don't even have a moment to sigh with relief before the young man tells them that the body isn't there because Jesus has been raised. Alarmed and uncertain, what do you do? Do you run out of the tomb because this is all more dangerous than you expected? Do you ask the young man who his mother is and how she made his robe so white? Do you stay and continue to listen to the young man? Who, by the way, looks a little bit like an angel. But, well, anyway, the women stay. But they still can't get their head around anything or a word in because the angelic young man keeps talking. And they haven't absorbed what he said so far, and now they're supposed to go tell the male disciples, especially Peter, who we all know denied he even knew Jesus, that Jesus is going to meet everyone in Galilee. The dead Jesus is going to head to Galilee. How is he going to get there? And what exactly are we going to see when we get there? His spirit? his body, and we thought Mary's explanation of the Immaculate Conception was perplexing. We don't know if the young man has more to say. It seems like there's a lot more we should know. How do we respond to all that we've seen and heard? Do we ask the young man who he is and what he's done with Jesus' body? Do you accept that the body is no longer there, but demand more information about this meeting in Galilee? Do you run out of the tomb? And this time, the women do flee the tomb in silence and terror. And this is where Mark ends. I mean, we can keep turning the page looking for the next part of the story, but, but it's not there. And we might begin to feel some of the women's anxiety. I mean, after all, we're here singing that Jesus Christ has risen today and proclaiming that death has lost its sing. And, and we pulled out all the alleluias, but Mark has abruptly left us with a terrified and awkward silence. Our Easter story is no longer a choose your own adventure. It's become a write your own adventure. What do we do now? Do you go tell the disciples what's happened? Do you return home and just try to process all of this? Do you swear to one another that we will never breathe a word of this to anyone? Mark doesn't tell us. We need to write the rest of the story. And I think that's pretty much where we all are now. The story we wrote last Easter isn't the same one we need to write now. Yes, we're still worshiping online and wearing masks and socially distancing, but unlike last year, we're not praying for a vaccine, but actually receiving it. However, even as we talk about getting back to normal, we know that life on the other side will be different. It's been a long time coming, but our emergence from our COVID-19 experience still feels abrupt and awkward. 
You might even find ourselves a little bit terrified about what's going to happen next. Do we call the other disciples and see if we can all road trip to Galilee together? Do we bring our mask and hand sanitizer with us and maintain proper social distancing? Do we avoid the trip because we're not really ready to be with a bunch of people again and, and we want to get the Zoom login instead? As I said at our sunrise service, Jesus, as the resurrection and the life, has new meaning for us this year. We're not coming out of the tomb after being dead for four days like Lazarus, but we're emerging from 13 months of COVID-19. And there's more to stepping out into our afterlife than simply removing our masks. Beginning this Easter, we'll need to write our own adventure, finishing what ended so abruptly last year. It'll be a story of, of what happens after we sat so long with our grief and fear and anxiety. But of course, that won't be the entire story. Like the women who brought the spices to Jesus' tomb, we also have our courageous and, and steadfast faithfulness stories. Now, like many writers, we might find it difficult to just get this story started. Even though we've heard about the vaccine's ability to begin meeting together in small vaccinated pods, we're still struggling to process this information. What do we do after we've received the second dose? Do we go out and begin to see other people in body and not just spirit or, or Zoom headshots? Do we continue eating takeout or do we finally go and eat in a restaurant? Do we go out and travel to see loved ones that we haven't seen in a year and just hug them until our arms ache? But our story won't be just about these adventurous things. You see, the women might have stopped to sit and catch their breath once they were away from the tomb. And like Mary, they might have pondered these things in their heart. And likewise, our story might also include a chapter about our time and reflection. We've been processing this ever-changing pandemic in real time. We might need to sit down and, and catch our breath. And there's many emotions and, and experiences that we need to work through. We need to find the words to express what has happened and, and how it's changed us. And maybe you've been doing this over the last year, but often we need the stress to be removed before we're truly able to sort out what we've been through. I've heard several people say they didn't realize how anxious they were until they received their first dose of the vaccination. Likewise, revelation doesn't only happen in an empty tomb. It continues as we leave it behind to go out into the world. Mark's gospel doesn't tell us what happens next. And scholars have always been uncomfortable with how his gospel ends, adding post-resurrection appearances and miracles and commissions to, to fool us into believing that we can tie up something as life-changing as Jesus into a tidy little ending. But that's not the truth of the resurrection and the life. Today is a marker between everything that came before and everything that will be. There's no going back to before or life as normal. The story hasn't ended in many ways. It's really just begun. We have this blank piece of paper in front of us. What's the story we'll write? Will we turn it into a fiction, letting the wave of relief of vaccination allow us to just push the last year away? Will we abandon the story, putting it in a drawer like an unfinished novel that we never let anyone read? Will we include 
new hobbies and exercise routines that we take with us into the next chapter of our story? Will we write a story of relationships we need to approach differently? Or our new understanding that a lot of things we used to think were important really aren't as important as we thought. Mark doesn't tell us what the women do, but we know they chose to tell their story. They didn't allow fear or the unknown stop them from sharing what they experienced. And we know that the disciples chose to move forward in their post-resurrection world, even though each step felt like the first. They chose to figure it out in the midst of a beloved community that was also figuring it out. They chose to live differently. They chose not to end the story with an abrupt, terrified silence, but to write an adventure that we continue to celebrate and live today. And now it's our turn. The resurrection and the life has come. How will you continue to write the adventure? Amen. And let us pray. Jesus, our risen Lord, when we stand before the empty tomb and comprehend the miracle of grace it represents, we may find ourselves with some fear and trembling. For your grace is the power of life over death. It is the power to choose to live differently. And we don't know exactly what that means. On this Easter Sunday, when we share not just this celebration, but the resurrection of our daily lives as the power of COVID-19 begins to lose its sting, let us not keep silent. May we go forward in our new life with greater peace, empathy, and love. Let us not settle for what has been written before, nor ignore what we have learned. Empower us with the faith and courage to write a new story, the adventure of what the resurrected life means to us. For you have risen. You have risen indeed. And so have we. Amen. Roll it away. Was 
soul was gone. My Lord came forth at the break of dawn, when the angel rolled that stone away. Alleluia, love to say, Christ the Savior took the sins that day, when the angel rolled that stone away. Lenten theme was again and again. Over the last six weeks, we've reflected on how again and again we find ourselves in challenging circumstances, and how again and again we find ourselves turning to God to save us. As we've walked the Lenten journey to the cross with Jesus, we have told the story of God with us, not once, but again and again. Today, we find that once again, the way of the cross does not end in a tomb, but in the resurrected life. We proclaim, as we have before, that the sun rises, not once, not sometimes, not only when we deserve it, but every day, again and again. For this reason, we can also declare that the love of God the grace of Jesus and the communion of the Holy Spirit are true not only on Easter, but again and again each and every day, just as each morning the sun rises. Beloved, this is indeed good news. Let us give thanks for all we've received. Let us pray. Creator God, in the midst of a formless void, a darkness over the face of the deep, you called for light. You commanded that chaos would end and that the sun would rise. And the sun has continued to rise. It rose over our bondage in Egypt and in our wilderness wanderings. It rose in the promised land and in all the places you lead us. Again and again, your sun shines upon us, a faithful promise of your love. Jesus, how different this sunrise must have looked as you became flesh and dwelled among us. Was it more of a wonder as you saw it through our eyes? Did its light inspire you to, to bring your light into our world? In what seemed to be a never-ending night of sickness and sin, of death and division, of failure and fear, you brought us into the morning light of your grace. Even when it seemed a permanent darkness had settled upon your cross, you made the sun to rise as you rose from the tomb. Again and again, we are reminded of the day when the sun will no longer set. Until that day comes, Holy Spirit, you continue to guide us in hope. You not only remind us that the sun will rise again, but lead us to bring its light to others. You continue to tell us the story of creation's first sunrise, of the first sunrise of Easter, the first sunrise when we realized that your son was for us. Therefore, we have come again with our faces to the rising sun, to the table you have prepared. We pray that you would bring us together in Jesus' name, and even more so that you would make us one in your communion. Together we continue to pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As he did throughout his life, and did so again in the resurrected life, Jesus ate and drank with his disciples. And I wonder if this ever just became ordinary for them. As we gather together today, we've brought the ordinary, a slice of bread, a, a cup of juice. We've come to the table before, but though it may seem ordinary, like the sun rising every day, we know that the Lord's table is extraordinary. 
For this is not simply bread that we can break with our hands, but the sign and seal of Christ's body broken for us. And this is not just a cup of juice, but the sign and seal of Christ's life poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. We proclaim these things to be as true as a sun that rises every morning. Come, let us share in the grace of Christ. Jesus Christ, the bread of life and the cup of salvation. Let us pray. Jesus, our risen Lord, we may not understand all that has happened on that first Easter morning, but we know it to be true. You have taken what is ordinary and helped us to see the extraordinary. As we go forth from this Easter celebration, let us live fully in the light of your Son. In joy and thanksgiving, we continue to proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Amen. Please join me in the call to offering. Holy God, the offering you call us to is more than our money. You call us to an offering of our lives. As we present our tithes and offerings, may we also reflect and commit our time and talent. dedication. Jesus, our risen Lord, may these gifts be a blessing not to our glory, but to yours alone. Give us the courage to follow them into the world so that your love may be known and life be made more abundant. Amen. In the morning when the world was begun And I danced in the moon and the stars and the sun And I came down from heaven and I danced on the earth At Bethlehem I had my birth Dance, dance then wherever you may be I am the Lord of the dance, said he And I'll lead you all wherever you may be And I'll lead you all in the Danced 
joy and thanksgiving to live the resurrected life and what an adventure it will be. The truth is that there will be times we tremble with fear and times we just want to close our eyes and wish it all away. But the greater truth is that grace holds us in each moment. Love guides our way. As we leave this space, may your mouth speak of God's goodness. May your arms hold those in need. May your feet walk towards justice. May your heart trust its worth. May your soul dance in God's grace. And may this be your rhythm again and again and again until God's promised day In the name of the beloved, the lover, and love itself, go with courage, go with heart, go in peace. Alleluia and amen. Amen.